Okay, let's do some topology. One superpower mathematicians have is to be systematic in our laziness. You can object that writing down a topology on a set is an extremely expensive process. After all, if we have a set of cardinality alpha, let's call it x, then its power set has cardinality 2 to the alpha, and the space of maps from the power set to the power set has cardinality 2 to the alpha times 2 to the alpha, where this is all in the exponent. Topologies are maps like this, so we have to pick out in this set some of the things that are topologies. This set, of course, is enormous compared to the size of x itself. This is a lot of data to specify. Now you might say, well, that might not be the most efficient way to give a topology. Maybe we should give the topology instead by giving the open sets. In that case, we're picking an element of the power set of the power set of x. We're collecting a family of open subsets of x together. But the cardinality of this set is 2 to the 2 to the alpha, and that's also very, very large. And in fact, you see this sort of growth when you think about topologies on finite sets. It's quite difficult to compute the number of topologies on a set of order n, like this. But here are the first few values. And you see that the growth of this number relative to n is extremely large. So this suggests that we should probably try to be more efficient in writing down a topology. Moreover, it would really help a lot if we could be more efficient in writing down a topology on a set x in a way that makes the continuous maps easy to identify. In particular, let's try to be inspired by the situation with subspaces of Euclidean space, where we had this characterization of continuity in terms of epsilons and deltas. That leads us to the following definition. We'll let x be any set whatsoever, and we're going to collect some subsets of our x. So this is just a collection of subsets of x, and then we're going to generate a topology. We're going to speak of the topology generated by the set A. And this is the coarsest topology on X, such that every element of A is open in that topology. In this case, we say that A is a subbase for the topology tau. OK, that's all well and good, but how do we know that there even is such a coarse topology? We're asking for the coarsest topology such that every U in A is open. Does it exist? The next proposition says that it does. If you have a set and you have any collection of subsets of x, then the topology generated by a exists. That is to say, there is a coarsest topology such that the elements of a are open. Let's look at the proof. Let's first note that there exists a topology on x in which every u in a is open. The discrete topology has this property. So we know that there's at least one topology for which all of these guys are open. That's a good start. We want to consider all the possible topologies for which every u in A is open. Now if we contemplate all those topologies, what we're looking for is we're looking for the coarsest element of T, the one with the fewest open sets. So if we're trying to create the element of T with the fewest open sets, we could do something quite aggressive. We could just intersect the collections of open sets from all the topologies that we have. In other words, for every topology in tau, every topology such that every u in A is open, we can consider the collection OT of opens for that topology. And now we'll simply take the intersection over all tau in T of these collections of opens. This is going to be some new subset of the power set of x, and the claim is that this is the set of opens for a topology. What does it mean to be the set of opens for a topology? So our claim is that our intersection here, our O, is stable under finite intersections and arbitrary unions. What's true? What's true is that each of my O tau, for tau and t, is closed under finite intersections and arbitrary unions. That's the thing that we're going to use. So if sigma is a family of elements of O, then in particular it's a family of elements of O tau for any of these tau. And so that means that the union of the sigmas also lives in O tau, and if sigma is finite, then the intersection of the sigmas lives in O tau. But this is true for every single tau, and since O is just the intersection of these O taus, it follows that the union of the sigmas lives in O, 
and if sigma is finite, then the intersection also lives in O. O is now the set of opens for a topology. Since O is the set of opens for a topology, we know that there is now a topology with the property that it's coarser than all of these O taus. But in addition, we'll note that for every tau in T, A was a subset of O tau. Why is that? Because we demanded that we were only looking at those topologies such that the elements of A are open. But since, once again, O is the intersection of these O taus, that means that A is a subset of O itself. And so now we found a topology that's coarser than all of the O taus, such that nevertheless, the elements of A are open in that topology. Notice that this argument is quite easy, and the thing that makes it easy is the fact that we're using the characterization of topologies as systems of open subsets. This is one of the reasons why in most textbooks you'll find the definition of a topology as a system of open subsets rather than as this closeness relation that we've been using. It's exactly for the ability to make these kinds of proofs simple. Okay, so now we've seen that if we just take a random collection of subsets of a set, then we can generate a topology. So let's see this in action, and in fact we've already seen a good example of this. Let's look at the rays from minus infinity to a, and from a to plus infinity. Here the endpoint can be just any element of R. These form a subbase for the standard topology on R. These generate the standard topology on R. Okay, so that seems fair enough, but how do we understand these topologies? How do we understand what the open sets of this topology should actually be? For that, we're going to want an intermediate notion between the subbase of a topology and the topology itself. So first, let's do a set theoretic observation. If x is any set at all, and I write down a collection of subsets of that set, then for any other subset, u, this is an arbitrary subset, it needn't be an element of a, the following two conditions are equivalent. First, that u is a union of some elements of A. Second, that for every point of u, there exists an element v of A that contains the point, but is also completely contained in u. Good, so now let's put this into action. If we have a topological space x and a collection of open sets b, then we'll say that our friend b is a base for the topology tau if and only if every open set is a union of elements of B. Given the equivalence of those two characterizations, that's the same thing as saying that for every open set and every point of that open set, there exists an element of B, often called a basic open set, that contains my point that is contained inside my open set. Let's see now an example in the real line again. Let's consider the set of open intervals with arbitrary endpoints, and this is a base for the standard topology on R. This we've already seen because we know that the standard topology on R, the open sets in the standard topology on R, are exactly those sets that have the property that for every point, there exists an epsilon such that the little open interval centered at x of radius epsilon is completely contained in that open set. That's a characterization of the open sets that we saw for the standard topology on R. So this really is a good base for the topology. And indeed, the notion of base is exactly abstracted from the good things that we liked about the standard topology on R. So now we can start to identify the open sets inside our topology when we're equipped with a base or a subbase. So suppose that we have a topology with subbase A. Now let's look at the set of finite intersections of elements of A, and let's call that set B. Then B is actually a base for tau. So now we understand that if we have a subbase A, then we can generate a base just by taking all the finite intersections of the elements of that A, and then we can generate the topology itself by taking all of the unions of the elements of B. So in our example of the real line, remember we had a subbase consisting of just the rays, either in one direction or the other, the finite intersections of the rays give you these open intervals, and these open intervals form a base for the topology. Every open subset of R can be written as a union of open intervals. Okay, so let's see some more examples here. Let's look at some bases and subbases for any Euclidean space Rn. Well, here's a collection of bases now. So first I can just take the balls of radius epsilon centered at various points of Rn. Here I'm allowing any point of Rn and any epsilon greater than zero. So the radius can be anything positive and the point can be anywhere on Rn. I can pare down which points 
and which radii I choose for my balls, I can choose instead points whose coordinates are all rational numbers, and I can demand that my epsilon just be of the form 1 over k, where k is some natural number, some positive natural number. That provides another good example. Notice that this basis for Rn is actually a countable set. Here's another basis of a somewhat different kind. I could take instead of these round shapes given to you by the balls, I can instead take boxes. I can take the open intervals from ai to bi, where I just have some real numbers ai and bi, and I can take the open interval and product those things all together as i goes from 1 to n. So these are now boxes inside my Euclidean space, and the collection of boxes also forms a base for my topology. Once again, I don't have to allow ai and bi to be arbitrary real numbers. I can force them to be rational numbers if I like. This provides me with a nice countable basis for my topology. Okay, so those are some bases. Any open set can be written as a union of the elements of any one of these classes. But if I want to be even lazier, then instead of looking at bases, I can look at sub-bases. Here I can be very relaxed. Here I'm looking at the inverse image under the projection map onto the ith factor of the open interval from a to b, where a and b are just some rational numbers. And I'm going to do that for every single i and for every pair of rational numbers a and b. And this is going to provide me with a subbase for the topology on Rn. Here I took the open intervals and pulled those back along the projection map. I can be still lazier. I can take the open rays in each direction and pull those back along the projection maps onto the ith factor. Each of these are subbases. There's a local notion of basis as well. Let's write it down. If you have a topological space and you have a point of that topological space, then you can look at a collection B sub X of open neighborhoods of X. So these are open subsets of my X that contain my point little x. This is called a local basis at X if and only if every open neighborhood of x contains one of these elements v of bx. If you have a local basis for every single point, then you can put those together to give you a basis for the topology. Okay, so why bother with all this? The excuse that we've given for dealing with this sort of thing is first that it's quite an efficient way to write down a topological space. If I can just tell you what some basis elements are, or some sub-basis elements are, then I'll generate a topology at a very low cost. That's quite efficient, but it's more than just efficient. It actually allows us to see certain properties of the topological space very, very readily. So to illustrate this, let's consider the situation in which we have two topological spaces, x and y. We'll take ourselves a point of our x, which I'll call little x as usual. We'll let a be a subbase of y, and we'll let bx be a local base at x. Now let's look at some various properties. If I've got a map from x to y, how can I tell whether it's continuous? Well, it's continuous if and only if the inverse image of every open set is open, but since the open sets are generated by taking finite intersections and unions of elements of A, it's enough just to check that the elements of our subbase A, when I take their inverse images, remain open. This means that if I have a map to a space and that space has a subbase, then I can check the inverse images of those elements of that subbase are open. And as long as I do that, then I've checked that in fact my map is continuous. Better still, if I want to check, for example, continuity at our point little x, then what must I check? Well, I have to check that for every element of the subbase in y, such that the image of x lies in that element, in that w, there exists an element of my local basis, b sub x, whose image is completely contained in that w. Notice that this is exactly the analog of the epsilon delta definition of continuity at a point that we learned in analysis for subspaces of Euclidean space. A map f is continuous at a point if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, that epsilon is specifying a subbase element in my target, there exists a delta that's specifying an element of my local basis of x such that, well, the image of the little open neighborhood of size delta is completely contained in the open neighborhood of size epsilon. And that's exactly this condition. And now finally, we can also extract our notion of closeness from our base. If we have a subset of x, then our little x is close to that subset if and only if every element of our local base intersects our s. 
So these are the ways in which we can use the idea of a base or a subbase or a local base for the topology. Now we can use these ideas to generate topologies and we can use them to generate topologies that have nice bases. Here's the proposition. So suppose that I have a set X and I have a subset of the power set, that is to say a collection of subsets of my X. And suppose that it has the property that if I take two elements of my B, V and W, and I take a point of the intersection, then there's another element of B such that X is there inside that element, but that element is also completely contained in the intersection of those two elements of B. In that case, well, of course, because B is just any old subset of the power set, I can generate a topology. I'm always allowed to do that. But in this case, if I have this condition here, the topology that's generated will have a base, and that base will be B. So now to conclude, let's look at a very strange example, which is often used as a kind of counterexample for some of your expectations that you might have in topology. This is the Sorgenfrei topology on the set of real numbers. We have on our real numbers the usual standard topology, but this is some weird topology that we're going to introduce. And how are we going to do it? Well, whereas before the standard topology on R is generated by taking the open intervals, and the open intervals form a nice base for the topology, here we're going to take the half open intervals. In this case, I'm only going to consider the ones that are half open on this side. So I'll take these intervals and I will generate a topology. Now the half open intervals exactly satisfy this criterion. Since the half open intervals satisfy this criterion, it follows that the topology that's generated has this set as a base for the topology. So what does this topology look like? Well, sometimes this is called the lower limit topology. Well, if I have a point, x and r, and I have a subset, s of r, x is close to s if and only if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a point of s such that, well, s needs to be greater than x, but it will have to be within epsilon of that x. This is quite a strange topology because it has a basis consisting of clopen subsets. These intervals are all clopens. They're both open and closed. 